Kazakhstan voters elect a new parliament that will consist of more than one political party, a first for this former Soviet country. But are we really seeing a move towards democracy? And does the West really care about political reform or human rights when dealing with this oil-rich nation? This is Inside Story. And welcome to the program. I'm Sue Turton. It is an election that will test the stability of a fragile nation. The people of Kazakhstan headed to the polls on Sunday to vote in parliamentary elections. Every seat in parliament currently belongs to President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev's party, Nur Otan. But a new election law passed three years ago means at least two seats in the new parliament will be held by the party that comes second, no matter what share of the vote it polls. Yet no real opposition has been permitted to stand and the president's party is assured a huge majority. While well, Sunday's elections take place in the shadow of last month's protests and violence, the worst Kazakhstan has seen since independence 20 years ago. On December the 16th, clashes broke out in the city of Zhenawazen when police opened fire on striking oil workers who had occupied a city square to demand better wages. The following day, police again opened fire on oil workers in the town of Shepa, killing at least one protester. The government said that the violence, which killed at least 17 people and injured over 100, was an attempt to destabilise the country by so-called outside forces. It described the strikers as hooligans. So is Kazakhstan really on the path to reform and democracy? Well, to help answer this question, we are joined by our guests. In Almaty, Joanna Lillis, a freelance journalist who writes for Eurasianet. In Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, an analyst and columnist for Novaya Gazeta. And joining us from Astana, via Skype, Roman Vasilenko, a spokesman for the Foreign Ministry. Welcome to you all. If I can start with you, Mr. Vasilenko. Um, the international observers say Kazakhstan has never had a free and fair election. Um, Last year's presidential election, they were accused of bo uh, ballot box uh, stuffing, voter intimidation and a lack of transparency. Is this election any different? Well, uh, certainly. I will tell you that Kazakhstan indeed is on a road to greater democracy. This election has been some of the most competitive uh, I have seen in, in years. We have um, seven parties running for parliament. Uh, now. Under law, the second uh, party, even if it doesn't clear the 7% threshold, will still uh, be able to enter the parliament. And we think that this will be uh, a step towards a more robust political system and a more intense political debates in the parliament. Joanna Lillis, you're on the ground. Um, is this a greater move towards democracy? Is it a multi-party system now? Well, I think it's worth pointing out that of the seven parties that are standing for parliament that Mr. Vasilenko mentioned, uh, one of them is the ruling Noatan party, and uh, most of the others are not critical of the administration. There is only one uh, force that could be called opposition that is standing called the OSDP. Uh, most uh, genuine opposition forces have been ruled out of this part of parliamentary election and even the OSDP had some of its uh, most uh, visible faces, two leaders, disqualified at a very late stage. Um, so I think um, human rights advocates believe that there are serious questions over the legitimacy of the election and democracy act advocates would have liked to see uh, more opposition forces in standing in the election. Have you seen any evidence so far of any vote rigging, of any ballot boxes being stuffed? Is there any rumour going around that there, there, is, there are irregularities going on? Oh, well, there are more than rumours. I mean, activists who are monitoring the votes are alleging that uh, people are being bused to uh, polling stations and that they're, they're, there is um, an inflated turnout and um, that uh, they're not expecting a fair result. But I think um, for that, obviously, it, it's only fair to wait until the uh, international observers give their verdict, which will be only tomorrow. As you said before, Kazakhstan's never had a free and fair election that's been deemed credible by international observers. Uh, President Nazarbayev has pledged to hold on this time um, but uh, as I said the international observers will be delivering their verdict tomorrow. 
Pavel Felgenhauer, um, Mr. Vasilenko did mention there how there has been a change in the law that now a second party must be included in Parliament for the first time uh, and that there, there is seemingly a move towards a more democratic system. Are you heartened by this? Uh, well, Kazakhstan is run by one man, uh, the all-time president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, who's been in power for more than 20 years since uh, Kazakhstan gained independence. Uh, parliament in Kazakhstan is basically a rubber stamp organization, which uh, approves everything that it's ordered to. Uh, right now, it's the, uh, as one party, if it's going to be totally dominated by one party, but there's going to be a small fraction of the opposition, won't really change much. But these elections are, of course, important. For the regime in Kazakhstan, the most important thing is uh, the turnout, actually, not the result. Because a large turnout gives legitimacy uh, to the authoritarian regime, and that's... Uh, the, the paramount importance, uh, very politically important. So Kazakhstan will continue basically as it is. The only serious problem is that uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev cannot live forever. And when he's gone, uh, anything can happen in Kazakhstan. Mr. Vasilenko, you are saying that there is a change to the political situation, but are we really thinking that there will be open and free debate in Parliament? Because the second party that looks like it's going to be putting uh, people inside uh, the Parliament, it, it never really criticises uh, the government. Uh, let me say a couple of things, uh, comments to what I just heard. Um, indeed, um, the uh, political system has been changing and has been changing slowly. But um, I think that this time around you will see a much, much more intense debates in the parliament. And the, and the party, the second uh, party which will enter the parliament, and they, they may be even a third party in the parliament, they will be, well, simply stupid if they will simply, you know, uh, pander off to the government and will not criticize the government because they will lose their votes next time around. But I will tell you uh, something. Um, recently, a poll was published which showed that 85% of the Kazakhs are happy with their lives. Well, not, not like that. 85% of the people said they think that the country is moving in the right direction. To me, it's a very powerful signal. Now, people have said that polls are unreliable in Kazakhstan. Well, polls are unreliable in many other countries. But to me, it just says that people are indeed in favor of uh, the political situation, they see a um, uh, reason to vote for the ruling party. Um, one big reason is that people want stability and people want economic opportunity. And the ruling party has ensured that. But of course, you will see um, more support for other parties because people also understand that having only one party dominate the debate and uh, do, uh, as Mr. Uh, Fagenhauer says, um, rubber stamp uh, the decisions that uh, are ordered to the parliament is not good. And, well, it's never been like that, but anyway, it's not the point. Um, they will want a more intense debate. They will want more intense uh, political discourse, and uh, they want more uh, representation. Um, they yeah, want. Let me uh, pick up on that point that you're making, Mr. Vasilenko, and, and put put it to Joanna Lillis. P people do seem to widely support the president. There has been violence in the West, but generally it appears that the people don't really blame the government for that violence and for the deaths there. Why is it that the people of Kazakhstan are willing to carry on with this president and, and not really complain, not take to the streets? Well, I think critics of the administration would say that there would be one answer to that. And um, uh, the, the chief answer might be that um, the, the state media propagates a vision of Kazakhstan, a certain vision of Kazakhstan, and that uh, uh, people, well, critics might say that people are being blinded by government spin. Um, on the other hand, it's true what Mr. Vasilenko says, that there's widespread support for the president. Um, people do generally support him. And um, many people are happy with rising living standards and so on. And for that reason, I think we're seeing a dislocation um, between uh, the opinions of people in other parts of the country and the opinions of people who uh, protested in Western Kazakhstan. Uh, it might be interesting to note that during my conversations with voters in Almaty today, um, I haven't seen any evidence that the, Zhang, the violence in Zhang Ozien has been swaying voter opinion. 
um, really uh, people continue to be broadly supportive of the ruling party. Um, so I think that's an interesting point to make. People don't seem to connect with uh, the protesters in the West. And I think it's true to say that critics would uh, put that down to government spin, uh, the way the government has managed the situation. After all, we still don't really know what's going on in Zheng Ruizian. It's under a state of emergency and there is very little access. Although it's also worth pointing out that international observers have had access to the town today. I just want to move on now to the way the international community views the way that Kazakhstan is governed. And President Nursultan Nazanayev has been in power since Kazakhstan gained independence in 1991. Since then, he has ruled the country under a one-party state that the West has been happy to do business with. In August 1995, a new constitution grants him greater presidential powers. Four years later, Nazarbayev is re-elected with over 81% of the vote in a poll where opposition candidates are, are banned. In 2001, Kazakhstan strengthens its regional ties, joining China and Russia to launch the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Six months later, then U.S. President George W. Bush declares a commitment to a long-term strategic partnership with Kazakhstan. 2005 and Nazarbayev is re-elected again and four years on the French president Nicolas Sarkozy visits Kazakhstan to personally oversee six billion dollars worth of oil gas and nuclear deals well in 2010 Nazarbayev is titled leader of the nation granted him immunity from prosecution and political power even after retirement then last year he wins yet another overwhelming victory in presidential elections well if I could turn to um, Pavel Fagenhauer, the international community, in particular the West, seems quite happy to do business uh, with Kazakhstan. Why is it that they are seemingly willing to turn a blind eye to any claims that, that it is an authoritarian regime and that there may have been human rights abuses? Well, the uh, West uh, doesn't is, fears most the destabilization of Central Asia, uh, which has authoritarian regimes in all the so-called Stan countries. And Kazakhstan is not the most oppressive. There are more oppressive regimes, say, in Uzbekistan and, Tajik and uh, Tajikistan, and especially Turkmenistan. Uh, but the alternative, uh, destabilization, where uh, Islamist uh, or pro-Islamic pro po political groups may uh, gain power is much worse. So the West turns a blind eye not only on Kazakhstan, but on the rest too. And not only the West, of course, the present status quo, and everyone wants the status quo to more or less continue in Central Asia. It's supported by China, by Russia, of course, and actually also by the Islamic Republic of Iran, which doesn't want to see Sunni uh, pro-Islamic forces come to power in, in neighboring Central Asia. So um, almost all the outside world, and also including India, uh, want the situation to be stable and are happy with the status quo. But of course, the status quo cannot continue indefinitely. There are problems in Kazakhstan, which the recent riots have shown. And as I already said, uh, Nazar uh, President Nazarbayev can't live forever. And when he goes, inevitably, the uh, situation there may get out of hand. No one knows for sure. Joanna Lillis, apart from the violence that has occurred just in December, what other human rights abuses are there concerns about in this country? Well, if we return, um, just returning for a second um, to the to Zhang Erzien, when we're talking about human rights abuses, um, Human Rights Watch has alleged that there's been widespread abuse of detainees, including torture. Um, eyewitness accounts have also said the same, and I myself have talked to people in Zhang Erzien Hospital when I visited the town who were covered in bruises and said they'd been beaten up by the security forces. Um, in terms of other abuses, um, we're talking about uh, abuses of political freedom which we've already discussed to some extent, critics allege. Um, and we're talking also about um, an environment in which the media cannot be described as free. Um, there are, the media is dominated by state and also pro-government outlets. Uh, there are a number of independent outlets which uh, exist, and that is not true in all the countries of Central Asia. Some don't allow them. Um, but we're still talking about a very uh, restrictive environment in terms of the media. So we're talking here political and media freedoms, um, and also we have a question of religious rights as well. 
Kazakhstan has had to tackle a terrorism problem this year, and it's passed uh, a, re a new law governing religious affairs, which uh, critics say is too restrictive. It bans prayer in public institutions, for example. So we're talking, you know, some a number of uh, issues across the spectrum that human rights activists raise. Reverend Vasilenko, those sorts of reports don't play well in the international community. Have you been pressurized by your economic partners in the West to move more towards democracy and to work out these sorts of human rights abuses? Absolutely. Uh, last night, um, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton called uh, the uh, Kazakh foreign minister to discuss several issues, and I can uh, tell you which uh, they were. One was um, uh, the support for Kazakhstan's uh, commitment to the holding of free and fair election and uh, especially the support for the decision of the president to go ahead uh, with the election in Janauzin, despite the state of emergency there. But this is all part of the discussions continuously and we see these discussions as an important element of our overall relationship. And I would mention the third issue that Secretary Clinton and Foreign Minister Kazakhanov discussed yesterday was the upcoming uh, participation of President Nazarbayev in the Seoul um, Summit on Nuclear Safety and Security in March 2012, where a meeting between the two presidents and other leaders is sh scheduled to discuss this present issue. If I can come back to Zanauzen uh, for a little bit and... Uh, can I, I just interrupt you there just very briefly? I just wanted to ask Pavel Felgenhauer a question on Zanauzen first. Um, you were talking earlier about how it's a positive move that uh, a second party has now been brought into Parliament. But the violence that we've seen just in the last month across to the west of the country, do you think that could spread, if, especially if people are disaffected by this poll? Do you think we could be seeing more violence to the west? Well, with such countries like Kazakhstan, it's very hard to predict. I mean, the, that, what, uh, the violence that happened in Western Kazakhstan was uh, due to actually not political, it was economically driven uh, by uh, workers who were not paid in time, uh, actually in the oil industry, that is the backbone of the Kazakh uh, prosperity. Uh, Kazakhstan has shown a remarkable economic progress in the last 20 years under President Nazarbayev. But if there's going to be problems in the economic sphere, uh, that could translate into uh, political violence and instability. So uh, Kazakhstan very much uh, depends on uh, its exports of oil and uh, uh, other raw materials and uh, for the po for political stability and for economic survival. And so if there's going to be more economic problems, which is possible, we could see more violence could also, that could also translate into eco from economic to, uh, to political. But I don't see right now that this is uh, kind of is going to snowball from the west of Kazakhstan into the center of the country. It seems right now the situation is under control. Um, Mr. Vasilenko, that seems to be the point, really, that the violence in Genoa Zen was due to economic problems. Um, is that really the thrust that the, that the government's going to have to really address now, is to try and um, reducing that real extreme between those who have a lot of money and those who don't in a country which you have, which is so rich in oil? Um, well, the actual reason for the... Um problems in Zanauzian was not that the, some people were dissatisfied that, with other people getting too rich. Uh, just to move on to Joanna uh, Lillis, give us an, an idea of what it's like for ordinary Kazakhs. Uh, there's a lot of talk about soaring food prices, about really low pensions. H how tough is it for many people in the country? Well, I think it is tough for many people in the country, and I think that the you know outbreak of disaffection that spilled over into violence in the West indicates that. And I think it also indicates that perhaps the government needs to listen more to these people. Um, you know, Astana likes uh, to portray an image of Kazakhstan as a wonderful place to live, and for many people it is. Um, but there are, as you as you say, there is a great disparity which is always increasing between the haves and the have-nots. So while we uh, see in 
cities like Astana and Almaty, we see designer boutiques, uh, the streets full of jeeps, uh, many rich people. If you go out into the countryside, you'll find places that don't have running water. Indeed, if you go to some districts of Astana, you'll find people getting their water from a standpipe. So I think what uh, might be at issue here is the question of uh, the government addressing the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And if we can go back to you, Mr. Vasilenko, um, on that subject, you were saying, well, really, the violence in the West wasn't due to the extreme difference. But that is a, that is a huge problem in your country, is it not? That the, there is great wealth for many people and not for others. It is a problem, but I wouldn't characterize it as a huge problem because I see the growing number of the middle class people. And that's why, by the way, we, we think that um, the second party that may join the parliament uh, all by itself, clearing the 7% threshold, will be Agjol, the party which is pro-business. Um, overall, there is close to 1 million uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Kazakhstan. So uh, people are making money. People are getting uh, a better lives for themselves when they are able to implement their ideas. Uh, going back to Zhanauzian, it's uh, an issue that keeps uh, sort of uh, coming back in our discussion. Uh, the government now realizes that much, much more needs to be done to address the problems of the uh, workers there and of the so-called single industry settlements because this is a city set up 50 years ago to service a nearby oil field which is now going into the decline in production but the government uh, has agreed to set up a separate uh, drilling company uh, next door to drill for more oil and to hopefully employ all the people and I can tell you now that out of the 2000 striking oil workers that were dismissed in the summer. More than 2,000 uh, oil workers have now reapplied for jobs. But this is not just that. The government realizes that um, uh, single industry settlements are a big problem, and we have quite a few elsewhere in the country. And that's why it wants to make Zhanauzen now into a, a, a model city and uh, change the change the paradigm there completely for the people so that they have some, uh, um, well, some, some light ahead. Um, in terms of the economic uh, situation, I can also tell you that um, um, Kazakhstan was hit by the global economic crisis in 2007, 8 and 9, but the economy did not go into recession. It, uh, it slowed down. However, it uh, jumped up again to 7.5% last year. Of course, uh, this has to do with the price for oil, which is one of the main export uh, commodities for Kazakhstan, yeah, but not the pick, only I can pick up on that point, actually, Mr. Vasilenko, to Pavel Felganhauer. Um, really, th this country is doing extremely well. The economy is doing extremely well in the face of so many other nations that aren't doing as well. Um, what do you think this is really looking forwards? What is this going to do for the people? Do you believe that the government really is going to try and trickle down more wealth? Almost, yes, of course, they'll try, but that uh, has its own problems because if you begin to create a middle class, a middle class uh, will not be content to uh, live under the great leader and in a one party state. Mid uh, countries with expanding middle classes uh, uh, tend to turn to political uh, pluralism. So, uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, economic development gives stability now, but in the future, it could lead to Kazakhstan beginning to develop into a direction of a real, more real democracy than right now. Uh, so, I mean, this ha has its own drawbacks, economic development, and uh, they have to run increasingly faster to keep the population content, and that, since they're centered on exports of uh, raw materials, mostly, the Kazakh uh, uh, economy and the uh, Kazakh prosperity, uh, that makes them vulnerable to changes in the uh, world prices for raw materials and oil. Right now they're high, but no one knows what's going to be in two or three years, and that's a big risk. We will be watching carefully as to the future in the next two or three years. I want to say thank you now to my guests, Joanna Lillis, uh, Pavel Falgenhauer and Roman Vasilenko. Thank you for joining us. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, we'd love to read it. Just email us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.